What's up, guys, and welcome back to The Dad Podcast, hosted by myself, Sean Stafford. This is the place for everything fitness, fun, a little bit of fatherhood, and loads of stuff in between. So today's episode is a special episode. We're powered by the guys at Optimum Nutrition, and today we have two very special guests in the studio with me. We have editor of Men's Fitness, co-creator of The New Body Plan, also best-selling author and fitness expert for Five Live and Tools Talk Sport, Mr. Joe Warner. Hi there, Sean. How are you? Thank Good you. Thank. Good, thank you. How are you? <laughs> <laughs> and sitting alongside him and making him look very ugly today, the beautiful <laughs> Dr. Amelia Thompson. So Amelia is a registered nutritionist. She's an online nutrition consultant alongside being a lecturer in sports nutrition with a PhD in exercise physiology. Have mm. I got that right? Yeah, it makes me sound really smart. <laughs> uh, you are really smart. But not only are you smart, you've also competed in bikini. Mm. So you know your way around a gym. And you are working with Optimum Nutrition on our education platform. So you've been a very busy girl as well. Very busy, yes. So I'm, I apologize. I probably butchered. Did I butcher your no, intros? I think it's pretty good for me. Was it pretty, pretty all right? Okay, I'm glad I got it right. But something I like to do with all of my guests is get you guys to introduce yourselves <laughs> as if you're in an elevator. So, you know, when someone goes, oh, what do you do? And you don't reel off what I just said. So how would you describe yourself to someone you've only just met? Do you want me to go first? Go uh, that's a really good question. I have not really thought of it like that before. I guess I'd say I was a journalist first and foremost, but I have been very lucky over the years to spend a lot of time with, with, with guys like you, Sean, and a lot of guys at the top of the fitness industry. And oh, through, stop it. Through os- <laughs> I'm not going to ask you easier questions just because you're buttering me up. But, but through osmosis, you, you get to learn an awful lot. So I've, I've been very lucky to, to spend a lot of my career in gyms, talking to people who know what they're doing. And yeah, fitness journalist first and a little bit of expertise has come along with that. Cool. That was a detailed left it introduction. It was longer than 30 seconds. <laughs> yeah, like, he, he went from the first floor to the 31st <laughs> yeah. floor there. I'm going like one to five. Um, I, I'm a nutritionist and I work predominantly with females, usually, who are trying to improve their relationship with food. And that's cool. really my main focus. So although I do a lot of nutrition around sports performance, most of my focus is a lot more holistic and looking at improving um, eating patterns and habits in, in mostly females. Cool. And what, and what did you do um, before you were a nutritionist? Or have you studied that studied, right away? Studied yeah, yeah, forever. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, like, what you know? Have you always wanted to be a nutritionist, or like when you when you were growing up, what did you want to be? I always wanted to be a doctor, right? Um, and then my school actually told me to aim lower, so I really? went to see the career service. I've spoken to quite a lot of women actually, and this has happened to them as well in their school. Yeah, yeah. I said I want to be a doctor, and she said, "Have you thought about being a nurse?" And I was like, "Oh God, okay, maybe I should. Maybe I shouldn't." Got all A's in my in my exams, but I didn't. I never pushed it because I didn't have the confidence to do it. No, I'm a doctor. Shocking. In a it's that bad, is right? shocking. Yeah, it's really, really bad. Um, and I, I yeah, my mum is m- appalled by it. <laughs> do, you, do you think that's because you're a woman? I don't or, know. Or do you think they would have said that to guys or guys as well? Like that's I don't really know. interesting. I was always really high achieving without sounding really overly confident. I was yeah. really high achieving, but I wasn't overly confident in myself. So right. I don't know if they just assumed that I wouldn't do as well as I did, or it was a female thing, or if it's yeah. from the area that I was from, um, which wasn't a bad area, but it wasn't necessarily the the best performing area. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so they didn't really, they didn't push it. They didn't push it at all. Well, you've gone in your face careers it's advisor. Pretty much how Doctor, time. <laughs> doctor, <laughs> yeah. Amelia, in the house. Yes. Oh, um, good for you. That's amazing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I wanted to work in elite sport and I started working in elite sport as a physiologist and then within two months I decided I didn't want to do it anymore. Do you know what? That's exactly the same as me. As in, Is it? I, I started working as a strength and conditioning coach with elite sport and academy athletes and rugby and very quickly realised that that's not what I was actually enjoying. And I enjoyed mm-hmm. working with taking sort of the same principles and stuff that you learn with dealing with elite athletes, but taking it to people that actually really care about it and yeah. it will have a material impact in their life. And I'm not saying that all athletes don't care about their performance, but I, something that a lot of them, it came so naturally to them that they weren't that engaged with it and they didn't really want to get better. Mm-hmm. They just want to be on the field playing sport rather than necessarily being in the gym trying to look at the bigger picture of improving yeah. and the margins are so small in elite sport yeah. you know the improvement that you can get in, in somebody that's never trained before is huge in their yeah. mindset and their performance yeah. and their body composition and their health but with elite sport the margins are so small yeah. that it really, you really have, really have to care about it otherwise it's it's kind of it's not as rewarding as working with sort of general population and other people 
And I, I found that, especially we, we had some um, some top level footballers in, and the amount they were getting paid and stuff, it just seemed. And mm. I'm not saying there's a correlation between getting paid a lot and not caring, but they just seem to just not care. <laughs> Do you and know, it was, it's because their entire life, if you're an elite level athlete, you've probably always done things kind of a certain way. You've got established maybe. patterns. You're not used to being told what to do. Maybe if you've you've grown up being the best yeah. kid in school. Yeah. It's fascinating how you both kind of did that for a short amount of time <laughs> and realised, actually, I'm going to get so much more from working with the general population here because they can almost be moulded there. It's a it's a blank slate to really improve someone's life, mm. isn't it? And a lot of the time um, with elite athletes, they would be given you and they would be given your, here's, here's Sean, he's a strength and conditioning coach, here's Amelia, she's a nutritionist. When you're sought out by somebody, so when someone comes to you, they have that hunger and that fire they're to really invested, make a change. Guess, exactly, they? they're yeah. already invested in it. Yeah. So it does make a difference. Um, right, you guys are no stranger to the gym, correct? I've been known. <laughs> You've been known to go to the gym. Um, what's your training like at the moment, Joe? Well, yeah, it's interesting because I recently was on the cover of Men's Fitness um, for, for our Feb New Year issue. Thank you. It helps uh, being the editor, though, doesn't it? it makes, be honest. <laughs> it does make a massive difference when that, that fi <laughs> the final decision gets made and there's always that, that casting vote in my favour. Should we put Sean on this month or should we put myself? Yeah, no, we'll put myself on this month. <laughs> Again. Is it, is it two to one now? Oh, you, yeah, yeah. I have to get that in. Um, so that was the second time I've been on the cover. So it, 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 the first time was when I was 30. I just turned 37. So the training for the end of last year was basically proving that there is no excuse to getting into cover model shape. What you have to do is just make sure it's your priority. There's going to be sacrifices. There's going to be yeah. a few nights out that you can't do. You're going to have to get on top of your diet, get on top of your training, prioritize that over everything else. But for a short you know, amount of time, it can be done no matter how busy you are. It's about those priorities. Yeah. So I've kind of come off the back of that and it's, it's very much been about maintenance since then, making sure I'm, I'm hitting the resistance training. I'm doing some hit as well. I'm also doing a, quite a lot of just running at the moment, just not necessarily for a physique point of view, just because I love it, for the mental health it, benefits. Yeah. Uh, I'm lucky I live in Stratford, so I've got the Olympic Park, I've got Victoria Park. It's a lovely place to run. That's where I run. That's where I was doing my marathon. I, I saw you once walking oh, yeah, down did, the canal. Yeah. I waved that you were absolutely I was gone. in the zone. I was zone. so focused. Exactly. <laughs> Couldn't believe how quickly you were going in the other direction. I was in so much pain. <laughs> I hate running. So it's, I'm basically in a nice place at the moment where it's kind of maintenance. want to get a little bit leaner because obviously thinking about the summer, yeah. always trying to put on a bit, bit of muscle. Just again, not necessarily for a vanity point of view, but because the tons of studies, the more muscle mass you have as you get a little bit older. And that's something I'm thinking about now. It's, it's about mobility. It's not just the abs, it's flexibility. 100%. It's wanting to be able to just move and, and, and do all the things I want to do as, as I do kind of get a little bit older. So it's a nice place to be where I'm kind of on top of it, but just trying out a few new things as well. Cool. And Amelia, what, what's, your, what's your gym time looking like at the moment? Because you still look in great shape. Well, thanks. Uh, yeah, gains on the display. Uh, gains, yes. <laughs> um, in a good way. Like You look like you left. I took, it in the, I took that in the right way. Um, I am probably similar in the sense that I've kind of, my focus is very much my health. I yeah. don't train to the point where I don't diet. I don't train myself to the point of extreme fatigue. I am very much resistance training, doing a little bit of cardio, but what I enjoy. I'm very focused on strength at the moment. So I'm following quite a structured strength training program, which is, you know, the basic compounds over and over again. So I'm literally squatting, deadlifting, benching and thrusting. That's basically it. And what, like three times a week, same exercises? Um, pretty much, two yeah. to three times a week. So I'm in the gym six, six days, but my sessions are short um, yeah. and they're very strength focused. Cool. Um, no really hypertrophy work really. Um, because I've competed for so long and I put my body through a lot um, for five years, you know what that's like. It, yeah. it really it affects your body and I'm 32 and I'm very much focused now on just trying to make my body healthy. Yeah. Um, so I've kind of laid off a lot of the hard work the very hard work and I'm yeah, just yeah. trying to f I treat exercise more like nourishment now like like nutrition you know? which is which is an amazing way of looking at it um, Joe so you've obviously been through a fair few transformations in your time right where you've it's all been brilliantly documented um, if you were going to say like what are the biggest take homes that you've got from going through those processes you know those journeys of transformation what kind of the take homes that you kind of would give to somebody to keep them kind of training hard and moving forward with their own progress i think the most important thing and it, it's not sexy it's not glamorous but you have to have a plan you have to know what you want to achieve you have to have a realistic time frame the goal needs to be challenging but it needs to be achievable to keep those motivation levels up make sure you know you are pushing in the right direction and I was in the gym yesterday and I, I trained just around the corner from where we are today and I was the only guy out of the entire gym to have a notebook and a pen yeah. and 
either everyone else in there has got an absolute brilliant memory and they know exactly what they're lifting for every session, for every set, for every rep. But I have to write things down because I need yeah. to know if I'm moving in the right direction or actually if I hit, hit a, a, a plateau with this lift because I need to maybe go away and do some assistance moves. No, I most people, I think, want to be leaner. Most yes. guys I, I, I deal with with the job at Men's Fitness, they want to lose weight predominantly and then they want kind of bigger muscles, bigger arms, bigger chest. But they're going into a gym without a plan. And yeah. my first transformation I did with a, a guy called Nick Mitchell, Ultimate Performance, it was all about planning. What can we do in 12 weeks? What's realistic? Let's, this is the end goal. We want to get you on the cover. How can we work backwards? Where do we need to be in, in 10 weeks? Where do we need to be in eight weeks? And again, like I said, it's it's not sexy, but without a plan and without kind of that goal, that roadmap, it, it's, it's like jumping in a car and, and not having not sat nav. It doesn't yeah. matter how great a drive you are, how fast you can push, you're probably going to end up going in circles because you're not targeted towards that destination. So I think that's probably the one take home lesson is have that goal and then work backwards from where you want to be to where you are now and, and plan each week, plan each fortnight, each block, however you want to phrase it, to make sure that everything you do is, 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 is training smarter, it's intelligent, and you're constantly moving closer to that goal. Yeah. So we, we, we've talked about it in, in some of my other podcasts is that going into a gym without a plan is the intensity that you bring to the session is usually absolutely rubbish just because there's that focus that you have where when it's numbers and it's reps and you're really pushing and you know what you lifted last week and you've got that inner monologue with yourself of trying to push yourself better. Yeah. Um, and it's this little psychological boost and it sounds really silly, but ticking off a set. Correct. Just writing, the, you know, you do a workout of 40 sets, 40 little ticks, you're going to feel good because yeah. we just, we're programmed just to feel good by achieving things and by moving more. I um, give myself a gold star for every set. I've got like a little, <laughs> a little roller thing, pull out my big stars and a uh, star chart. <laughs> One set down, <laughs> 22 to go. But you're absolutely right. I, I, they, they, I just end up shaking my head sometimes when I see guys walk in and you can see them, they walk in and it really frustrates me because uh, I spend my job trying to get people to think more about their health and fitness and yeah. a lot of people come to men's fitness because they don't know what to do. They're, all they know is that they're ready to make a positive change to their health and fitness and they come to us for the guidance. And I see guys in the gym and it, it does tend to be guys and they've done the hard bit, they've turned up, you're there. That's the hardest thing. That's the yeah. thing that most people don't ever, they don't get to that point. So then to get there and then kind of wander around and go and pick up some dumbbells and do some curls and then kind of think, oh, what shall I do now? You know, you've got all the potential is there and it's not being realized. And I think it's just, just by taking a step back and going, what do I want to do? What do I want to do today? What's my, what's my priority? Is it, is, is it you know, hypertrophy? Do I want to add muscle? Do I want to get lean? Or do I want to feel better? And yeah. having that plan and, and then combined with your motivation and determination, it all falls into place. That's really interesting. So, Amelia, so you've, obviously come from a from a background in competing in bikini um what would you say kind of the main differences between training for the stage and training for kind of all-round health and fitness training for the stage is a lot harder in terms of the effort that you have to put in obviously right. you have to be more consistent you can't really you know yourself when you're competing you, you can't really miss a session you can't yeah. really take it easy on yourself yeah. um and so you have to you have to be more motivated and you have to be more dedicated straight off um, it's far less compassionate towards yourself when you're competing um, I find that really interesting that you use that word it's so it's such a nice way of saying it as in there's an element like training for the stage there's an element of brutality about mm. it isn't it it's almost like a war of attrition it's masochistic it's yeah really, a little bit it is <laughs> whereas I think the way you described it you know you don't show yourself the same compassion mm. as you do is when you're like training for more health and wellness yeah and it's something i struggle with with some clients because i prep some girls still that compete yeah. and then i have a lot of clients who don't compete and i'm very compassionate in my approach as a coach yeah. um because that's one of my underlying principles but then when i've got a bikini athlete who's crying because she's so tired yeah and all i can really do is say have some more carbs today and that's all you can really do ultimately you still have to go away and, and be really mean to yourself anyway yeah um, i do find that quite hard when i when i'm working with clients um but they understand that um also with bikini you're very much obviously aesthetics focused so you are literally training to change how you look it's yeah. not really yes you can train for progressive overload and, and try and improve your strength but ultimately that's not the main outcome and um, whereas when you're training for health and fitness more lifestyle you're very much focused on you know am i lifting more this week is my volume greater this week and very much focused on your 
progressive um, volume in that sense. And bikini as well, you're very much training the same sort of areas. You know, you're training <laughs> booty, your butt and yeah, you're training yeah, your shoulders. Yeah. <laughs> it's, pr- it's pretty much like uh, I've seen Joe's current plan. He's just on that <laughs> booty builder plan. I can tell. Yeah, thank you. Peaches. <laughs> what? <laughs> but it is. And it's very focused on looking a certain way because that's yeah. what they judge you on. Whereas now, if I don't want to make my shoulders any bigger then I just won't really train too much of my shoulders or yeah. wh- whatever it is. So it's very much focused on what makes me feel good versus what other people subjectively say looks good. That's I think that's the nail on the head, isn't it? As in when you're when you're training for the stage, there's you're not necessarily training to feel good. No. You're training to feel good after the show. Yeah, you don't feel good when yeah, you're doing yeah, yeah. it at all. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um and if you're if you're training for kind of health and wellness then kind of how you feel and the, the, the positivity that you have with your relationship with training is is probably the primary focus, right? Mm-hmm. So you, you, you train because you want to feel good. Mm-hmm. But if we're stepping away from that and if you were going to try and give, from a training point of view, as Joe said, most people when they when they sort of reach out and say, you know, I want to drop a bit of body fat or I want to, you know, make my arms a little bit bigger. So I've, from a training point of view, what would you kind of say is, is the most important thing when it comes to maybe training for fat loss? I'd say be consistent and keep it simple. And I think it's it's that simple in a sense that people think that they have to do something really obscure. It's magical. Yeah, yeah. there's a magic trick. And they think yeah. they have to change things. So if they want to build muscle or they want to drop body fat, realistically, there's not a huge amount of difference between what you're going to do in the gym in terms yeah. of your resistance training. Yeah. And people think, All right, I'm going to train for hypertrophy, so I'm going to be doing this rep range um, and this is my focus. But then when I'm going to go do fat loss, I'm going to start doing like supersets and drop sets and yeah, yeah. like 20 reps instead of, you know, six to 12 or whatever it is. And people just think that they have to do something really obscure. And I find a lot of the time when I do programming for clients and I give them it and they say that that's just too straightforward. I'm only in the gym for 45 minutes. Like that's because you can still get, you can get more intensity in that 45 minutes. Still train for hypertrophy, even though you're trying to drop fat. And I think people yeah, yeah. just overcomplicate it and then they switch up the routines all the time because they think they have to do something like shock their bodies or something horrendous like that. When there's, it's just... there's a, there is a lot of BS flying around, right? <sighs> so much. So would you say that, um, would you say that from a training stimulus point of view, the difference necessarily between uh, putting on muscle and dropping body fat is probably less to do with the training and more mm. to do with the nutritional programming completely, behind it? Completely. Um, the changes come from the from your energy balance. Yeah. So, yeah, your macros might change a little bit, but your training can stay exactly the same, um, still focusing on um, progressive overload, still yeah. doing the same main lifts. Yeah. And all you do is change your nutrition and or add to more energy expenditure and cardio if you have to do that yeah. or whatever yeah. it is. It's interesting you say energy expenditure because I'm kind of talking here very much about kind of my mates who have never really been in shape. And yeah. they're coming to me now because they're late 30s and they're going, where's this belly come from? And you know, that classic, I won't name any names, but that classic, you know, <laughs> that classic skinny... You know, you know who you are. <laughs> that classic skinny fat physique where they yeah. don't have any muscle, but they, they're getting the belly. The and dad what, bod. Well, yeah, the classic dad pod. But what I, what I say to them is, is first and foremost is increase your energy expenditure. Like you say, don't even worry about what you're eating for to start with. And, and you guys might have a different opinion, but for people who've never really had any knowledge of, of how to get into shape, just start by doing more exercise. We'll, we'll look at the diet down the line. But if you can start increase your energy expenditure, you maybe you find something you really like doing and suddenly it's not feeling like a chore. It's feeling something you're looking forward to. Yeah. You're getting the mental health benefits. And because you're feeling good, you're starting to look a little bit better, you want to eat healthier. So it's not about what you're giving up. You're not giving up anything. You're gaining so much more. Yeah. So you might think, I'm, gaining up, I'm giving up chocolate. You're not. You're gaining more energy. And you're going to gain you know, that slightly tighter feel when, when you, you, you get ready for the gym or you get the pump on. So it's all about kind of doing things very simply, sustainably, one step at a time, and not going, right, I need to change everything now. So I'm going to start doing an hour's cardio a day on 750 calories. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Good luck with that. You know, it's going to last a day or two before you're, before you're miserable. And it's not about being miserable. Yes, it's about looking better and, fi- and feeling better, but it, you know, it's that holistic approach of what can I do that's just going to make me a little bit healthier and happier. And, and that, unfortunately, does take a little bit of time and, and getting to learn what works for you. It's really interesting that you said that you know, if, if someone came to you for advice, the first thing you would say is move more rather than eat less as in because a lot of people they throw the you know the numbers of 80 percent of transformation is in the kitchen not in the gym i think i I think you're completely right i think as soon as you start to restrict people and take things away then there's a negative connotation Mm -hmm. to it and i think also what you said about that moving more energy expenditure there's 
so many more benefits to exercise than just calorie burn. Right? As you said, there's, there's serotonin increases, there's endorphin release, mm-hmm. there's mental health, you know, clarity issues, that sort of stuff. And it gives you a bit of time to yourself, which you're investing in yourself. And you mentioned time there, and you know, I've got a, a couple of friends who've recently had kids, and they've maybe trained before in the past, but it's totally gone out of the window. Yeah. And, and they'll say to me, well, I don't have any time and I don't have any energy. And to me, it's, I kind of I try and make them reframe it, thinking, well, you don't have much time, but any, exercise will give you back more time than you put in. I firmly believe that yeah. because you'll be more productive, you'll be more motivated. All those little jobs that kind of feel like you're you're stuck in quicksand, you'll blitz through them if you've if you've got that endorphin buzz. And, and you know, it's, just, it's the same with time, the same with energy. You could be absolutely exhausted. There's no way I can do a 15 minute workout. You do it, I guarantee. No one ever finishes a session and goes, oh, I hate it, Dolph. I wish I hadn't done that. What a waste of time. You always feel yeah. better. So you're going to get that energy back. You're going to get that time back. And I just encourage anyone who doesn't think they have got the time or energy just to, just to move for 15 just minutes. Time. You've got to because it gives so much more back. Yeah, and they say they say that if you want to get something done, give it to a busy person. And from speaking from experience, <laughs> like my friends that don't have kids that complain about how busy they are, I just literally look at them going, "You wait." And how tired <laughs> they are as well. Yeah. Like oh yeah. yeah, I'm so tired. Coming on Monday morning, I'm so tired. I'm like, really? Mm. How was your line on Saturday and Sunday? I've been <laughs> one of those for three and a half years, mate. Um, but but you're 100 percent right. All it can take is 15 minutes of moving, a bit more, and that 15 minutes gives you back so much more at the end of the day. I think like you said, I mean, it's, it's people are so so desperate to find something that's almost complicated because mm. you think, well, if it's not complicated, why don't I look and feel great already? It, there must be a secret. There must be something. No one's letting me in on it. But it, it's not about overcomplicating it. I think my job at Men's Fitness and, and my team is to really strip back a lot of that overcomplication. overcomplication just say it's a case of, of moving your body more, keeping an eye on what you're eating, sorting your sleep and stress a massive. Yeah. But again, no one talks about that when it comes to body composition because you think it, it's got to be in the gym or the kitchen. They're the only places that, that get the results. Well, sort your sleep. I, mean, I tell my missus it's all about in the bedroom. <laughs> 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 yeah. I don't know if it's because of the sleep. I don't know. I'm just throwing that out there. But, you know, there is anything you can do to try and improve your sleep. It is going to lower your stress levels and, you know, you're going to deal with life a little bit better. You're going to have more energy. It's, it's like the jigsaw. You, you sort those those four key pillars and, and it's amazing that the difference you, you can make to your life and not just, again, with not just how you look, how you feel, how you perform, because that, that's what ultimately is, is what really matters. Yeah. And also, I think probably as in your role as, as editor of Men's Fitness, uh, you know, it's, it's it's not only making things simple and digestible, it's probably cutting back on a lot of BS that's out there. There's a lot of myths out there that kind of are so rife within this industry. Like Amelia, from your point of view, being a sort of registered nutritionist, mm. like what are the what are the, the, the biggest myths out there that you're kind of at the moment that you see that you're, you just want to kind of blow up? I have a few favourites. Far away. My first favourite is starvation mode. That's my ultimate favourite, where people come to me most days um, on social media or in the gym and say, I'm not eating enough calories because I've stopped dropping body fat and it's because I'm not eating enough food and I think I've damaged my metabolism. Or, you know, I've been having this many calories and I think that that it's stopped me from dropping body fat. And people that say that they've started to eat eat more calories and then they start to burn more body fat and it must be because they had metabolic damage or starvation mode or whatever it is that they call it, um, it is a question I get most days. And people think that by not eating a certain amount of food, like a minimum cutoff point, yeah. that they're going to, their metabolism just going to go, I can't work anymore and I'm going to stop working. And it's the same sort of thing as having to eat certain a certain number of meals a day to spike your metabolism or yeah, to yeah. boost your metabolism. Your metabolism doesn't work like that. It doesn't just stop working when you don't eat. You know, it doesn't stop working when you don't eat a certain amount of calories. That's not how it works. If you ate 500 calories religiously for a year, you would lose a lot of body fat. You would not hit starvation mode. Um, you wouldn't feel very good. You'd yeah, be yeah. <laughs> pretty miserable, right? Yeah, but. yeah, of course. And there's reasons why that wouldn't actually happen because of that you would start to move less and you would start to get diet fatigue so you would start to eat more without realizing it yeah. you would feel hungrier all of these adaptations do occur when you are on a low calorie diet and the reason why people start eating um start dropping body fat when they eat more is because actually when they eat more they f- they have more energy and so they start moving more and so they're burning more energy um but people genuinely believe that if they just don't eat and en- one of their problems is that they're not eating enough if you're yeah. not dropping body fat you are eating enough if not more than what you need 
And I think that's Interesting. something I get literally most days. And uh, and you must hear you must hear a lot because like you know in your in your position, Joe, like you must see so much rubbish. Like yeah. what what what's the one thing that like pees sure. you off the most? There's a lot to be honest. It's, it's fascinating. So I, I speak to some of the other other guys I work with about this, and it seems like health and fitness is is the one industry where everyone's an expert, but very few people are. And I don't think it happens in you know, architecture. Someone says, <laughs> I can I can design that building, no problem, let me have a crack at it. But, you know, it is an area where there are a lot of misconceptions. Um, I, I think that then the whole metabolic issue that you've just raised is, is definitely up there as well. I think it's people need it, thinking they need to be on a diet. I've got to be on keto. I've got to be on paleo. Yeah. You know, almost buying into to the only way of doing things. We're all massively different, you know. As Sean, what works for you won't won't necessarily work for me, yeah. and, and vice versa. It's it's all about finding the thing that you a you enjoy. You need to find a, a, an eating plan that you can see yourself doing yeah. for a, a, a number of years because it's it's not about depriving yourself. It's and like I said earlier, it's about you know finding things that you realise what you're gaining rather than you're giving up. And, and I think we are there are there are a lot of misconceptions out there at the moment, like the, the right way to train. It's it's about you know there is no right way. It depends on on you know yeah. what, what what floats your boat. What what you're going to stick to ultimately is the most important thing. What can you do consistently? Because that's that's what you're going to become. You can find a way to train. You can find a way to eat. You've won. Like it's it's yeah. it's not about chasing the abs. I think probably that's the one thing that people think I will be happy when, so what, rather yeah. than I, I'm 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 happy now because I'm in, in control of my training or my diet. Let's look at that. So what from your point of view, what does the average man on the street want to know about? nutrition i think they want to know what they can eat that's not going to seriously mess them up in terms of you know getting bigger because kind of like what they can get away with what they can get away with i don't think most people don't they, and they shouldn't want to live off chicken and broccoli i know that's the cliche of what what people eat to, to get into shape i think knowledge there's, that, there's rice in there as well there's chicken, chicken, <laughs> rice, chicken <laughs> rice and broccoli don't sorry don't, I don't even have the vital food group <laughs> Um, but I think there is almost a desire to want to know more, but not knowing where to look. Because yeah. as you said, there's so much information out there. So much misinformation as well. Misinformation right? out there, which, which is why I think the, you know some of the fitness magazines have managed to do well because it is you trust them. You, you know mm. you, they're, they're authoritative, and you can you can believe what you read in them. But the, you know, are carbs good or bad? Are fats, saturated fats, good or bad? Can, are you eating too much protein? All of this thing, it just completely jumbles up the average guy and girls on the street. No wonder they're confused about nutrition sure. because it's sometimes I have to take a step back and go, hang on, you know, I've read so many different things today. I'm not quite sure what I should believe in. I think a lot of that is to do with people wanting to attach their identity to something. People like to have... I want to be low carb, or I want to be keto, or yeah. I want to be paleo because it gives them, or I want to train in a certain way, I want to be a crossfitter. Crossfit. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. I'm glad you said that. I want to grow a beard and wear stance socks. Yeah. <laughs> but Crossfit. they do. It makes them feel like they're part of some community or they have this identity, which we yeah. all know is not their identity, but they like to latch onto that. And so then they become this little cult where they yeah. then share this message and it just gets exacerbated. Like Chinese whispers. Exactly. Yeah. I don't necessarily mm. think that... Um, community elements and that sort of stuff because I think if it gives them uh, not, a, not, a, not necessarily a sense of belonging <laughs> do you know what I mean but if it can help motivate them I think then that's not so much of a bad thing mm -hmm. but I think as soon as the message starts to get lost and through that kind of Chinese whispers-esque, you know, they lose the point of it. I think you're absolutely right. And anything that, that brings people together and makes them train, gives their training a purpose, you know, the camaraderie, the motivation. And my issue is the same as yours. It's when it that positivity then kind of spills over into but they're wrong we're yeah, right and yeah. they're wrong but don't, don't worry about what anyone else is doing as long as you're happy doing your thing you're getting the benefits you know let other people that maybe they'll come and join you but they're on their own journey and they need yeah. to get there first it's when it becomes a little bit preachy and that's not you know, that's not just crossfit that's anything it's vegans mate <laughs> all <laughs> you know, vegans all, in all, ve the world. <laughs> all vegans and all crossfitters heaven forbid we ever get a crossfitting vegan on here <laughs> The studio will implode. <laughs> no, as a little precursor, my in-laws are vegans and they're very healthy and they're very happy and they don't preach about being vegan. So not all vegans are preachy. What's Christmas dinner like, though? I had to say that. I had to cook Christmas dinner. That, well, I say I, my mum, my, my, <laughs> myself you? and my wife, we had to cook Christmas dinner. Um, she took the lead on it. But we had to do, because we had a normal Christmas dinner and then that we had our, my, my in-laws over and we had to do like a nut roast as well. We didn't have Yum. to, but we did a nut roast and it was delicious. Yeah. Um, and from their point of view, they're doing it for health reasons, for ethical reasons. Mm. And do you know what? From seeing it firsthand, what they were like before they were vegan and seeing kind of what they're like now, 
um, their health is so much better. And right. I don't know whether it's, you know, the, the byproduct of, of being vegan and removing dairy and, yeah. and meat and all that sort of stuff, but they look and feel much better. And, and from an ethical point of view and what they're doing for the environment from their point of view, it's their journey and they're on it. So I'm like, full power to you yeah. like mm. crack on yeah. Yeah. I also see the nightmare they have when going <laughs> yeah. to restaurants so I kind of well, feel sorry for them as well I've done the other thing because I was vegetarian for 21 years up until I was 30 and I was a vegetarian when nobody was a vegetarian like yeah, not you even, were a vegetarian when it wasn't cool <laughs> they, were, they weren't even vegans it was you know and you still couldn't get anything to eat so I've kind of come the other way and, and it's you know this is why we're all different I think because yeah. I've massively benefited from reintroducing meat and fish into my diet but you know it does take all sorts it's absolutely worth going you know vegan a few days a week because it might just find that some of those digestive issues or other problems you were having mm. suddenly have, uh, maybe eased a little bit it's why we you know we see ourselves as an experiment and never stop trying new things because you might just find something that absolutely clicks for you yeah so if we're looking at sort of nutrition in the context of busy lives busy people um amelia kind of what are the what are the key tips that you would give somebody kind of looking to get the most out of their nutrition prepping prepping yeah. yourself in a little bit in advance and I, I'm not a big advocate of prepping like you know having Tupperware and things yeah, in your yeah. fridge I think that's unrealistic but having things like just making your lunch the day before you can make your lunch in one go and you've got five lunches for your whole week yeah. it's probably going to be the same meal every day there's no reason why you can't eat the same meal every day for lunch yeah. and then it's prepped and it's done that's like a really really simple thing you can do and so you save easy. a fortune as well right and you save a fortune I think as well not trying to force yourself so things people that are really busy for maybe freak out because they can't eat breakfast or they can't eat the right meals in the day yeah. don't freak out about following some sort of rules that you have to eat breakfast yeah. you can skip breakfast it's not going to do you any harm at all your metabolism is going to be it's fine. not going to kill you again does nothing it doesn't make you obese it, do, yeah, yeah. It, it does nothing you just hold off eating later and I think people panic about little kind of food rules that they've seen um, publicised in the media things like you have to eat breakfast for yeah. example and it just stresses them out even more if you've got a really busy morning just go to work have your don't eat ooh, don't eat until lunch have your prep meal at lunch and then you're pretty much through the day yeah. have your dinner at home with your family um, yeah. I think people stress about the smaller things and having things prepared, having snacks, identifying things that are really easy snacks that are potentially high in protein to kind of tide you over in terms of your satiety is really yeah. useful. Things that you can pick up in the shop. So things like Greek yogurt, quark, cottage cheese. Yeah. Um, snacks like that that you can easily pick up on the go is really, really useful if you're very busy and you can just eat it as you go. What are your thoughts on like um, protein shakes, protein bars, that sort of stuff? Is that a go? Is that an easy go-to? Yeah. Is that a gimme? Yeah, I think yeah. they're really great to top up your daily protein requirements. They're really great. They're, they're tasty and they're really easily accessible. For people that travel a lot with work, that's something that I really... I do speak to people a lot about if you're traveling and not having access to consistent food and you're yeah. not knowing when you can go to the shop, I think having protein bars and shakes in your bag is really, really useful. Um, one of the it is quite, it is also quite hard to get, like, especially if you're training and you're lifting weights um, sort of four or five times a week, you know, and the kind of recommended daily amount of protein is what, two grams per kilo yeah. body weight, then um, it's quite hard to get mm. that all from you know, yeah. food, food. Yeah. And especially if you're busy. So I think, you know, having a shake or... It takes an awful lot of time and, and, and prep and, yeah. money, and money. If you you want to eat you know, good quality stuff, it's definitely where, where those sports nutrition products could come in. Yeah, I was like, from a from a pound per gram of mm -hmm. protein, right, as in you've got to look past, you know, the, you know, obviously we all, we all would rather get our nutritional requirements from whole food. Yeah, absolutely. But, but you know, when it when it does get busy and when you're trying to be pragmatic and when you're on the go and you you need to grab something that you is going to keep you moving to where you want to be something like a sports nutrition product a shake you know, after you train or a protein bar in between us, and they're so useful. Well, I, I really struggle to eat after exercise. I'm not hungry. That's just yeah. my reaction. If I had a hard session, I'm not going to be able to eat for probably a couple of hours. So yeah. I'll always have a protein shake within half an hour afterwards, just because it makes me feel better. It's something in the stomach. Yeah. I know psychology is going to be helping me recover, and it's just it's just such an easy win. And one thing I'd add as well is, again, a lot of my friends who are, who are kind of struggling with their weight, I've told them, be mindful when you're eating. And again, it's really not sexy, and it makes your meals last a little bit longer but simply putting your knife and fork down between mouthfuls taking the time to turn off the tv turn off your phone sit with a mate sit with a partner whoever 
and just think about how the food tastes, you know, the texture. It's really hard to overeat if you're being mindful about yeah. what you're eating. You're going to get a ton more pleasure from your food. I'm sure you're probably going to improve your, your digestion because you're not wolfing it down. And, you know, I've lost count the amount of times I've seen mates with a packet of crisps in front of the TV and it's gone and they've gone to reach for another crisp and not even realise that they've finished the bag or, or yeah. the chocolate or whatever. That's me. <laughs> you can <laughs> get away with that. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, again, it's, it's, it's a really simple thing that anyone listening, you can do that today. Do your next meal, just be a little bit mindful. Think about the, the, the taste, think about the colours on the plate. All of these things are just going to kind of reframe your relationship with food a little bit and you're going to, I think personally, it's worked for me. You're going to have a better relationship with food. You're going to get more out of it and, and you're not going to overeat. And, and quite often that's, that's the, the key to, to, to losing some weight it's just to be aware of what you're eating and how often yeah I, I tend to work with 10 minutes a meal so I, with my clients one of the first habits I will ever give them no matter how busy they are is one meal per day take at least 10 minutes with no phone no TV nothing no distractions and then we'll develop that to say all of your meals are busy people that say that they, they have to eat their lunch at their desk I don't care unless you're a doctor or you're you know you're in surgery you can find 10 minutes to eat your lunch um, away from your desk and you're right like this makes such a difference to people because they register that they've eaten yeah. That, I mean, that makes such a big difference. And it's the same as what I was, I was talking about earlier, that simple one step. You don't have to do it for every meal. Yeah. Just like, you know, you don't have to go and hammer it the first session in the gym. It's yeah. about gradually reintroducing new habits to, to, to your life. Because if you do it slowly, if you do it at a sustainable pace, you, you see and feel the benefits, it's going to make it so much easier for that habit to stick. And that's where the health and, and the happiness benefits come from. Yeah. And you, and you just said something about, you know, after you've done a really tough session, you know, sometimes you you know you don't feel like eating you know what what do you think are the are like the most important things to do in order to kind of to maximize your recovery from a really tough training session well, the first thing is make sure i get some high quality protein in right and, and some carbs and is, well. is, that, is that the first thing so it's not like go and have a cold shower blah 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 no I will, I will as soon as that last set is done i'll go and get it i won't drink it all straight away because i will sip it because i again i'm not that, you're not, that you're hungry not that type of guy. then what the answer I'm going to tell you is I'll spend a good 10 minutes doing my stretching mobility work. Yeah. Sometimes it's not always that long. Like said, that, that's the ideal, Joe. <laughs> not necessarily the reality, Joe. Yeah, sometimes. Yeah. Um, and it, it is massively important. I see a lot of people, they, they literally finish that last set and they're straight out of the, the gym door back to work. Yeah. Um, whereas it is really important to spend that time just bringing your body back down to that resting state. The and just stasis kind of bring you back just, down to... Again, yeah. Not just even from a physical point of view. Again, getting you, letting your, your brain soak up all the benefits, thinking about the session, maybe making a couple of notes in your workout diary, what yeah. went well, what didn't go well. Again, it's it's not the glamorous stuff, but I think if I kind of tried to hammer home one point, it's not all about you know the big sexy things you can do. Yeah. It's about the small simple things that that are really easy to do. They don't take the any time. The one percenters exactly. that all add up. That really really quickly adds up. Yeah. So yeah, that's that's kind of my approach. So Amelia, if we're gonna if we're gonna try and wrap this up by giving 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 the people listening kind of the one percenters, kind of what small changes can someone make to their routine, for, kind of from a nutritional point of view to optimize their recovery. Okay. This might little might disagree with you a little bit. <laughs> hey, that's, that's the best thing about this, right? <laughs> when you it's said that, I thought, mm. um, well, no, it's not that what you said is wrong in terms of your nutrition at all. But in general, the evidence that's out there mm. suggests that we need protein like around training, um, before and after training, maybe between four and six hours apart and right. training somewhere in between this four to six hour window yeah. um, of, if you, if you know what your body weight is in kilograms, so say you're 70 kilograms, times that number by... 0.4 to 0.5 yeah so I can't do that mass in my head right now yeah, yeah. so whatever that number is have that in uh, that amount of protein in a meal go and train within you if know 70 kilos is 35 great there we go 35 grams of protein put Easy. your calculator away <laughs> hey there's no calculator this is, all the guys watching good. on YouTube there's no calculator here <laughs> just up here I can't do that not when I'm talking <laughs> <laughs> um, so 35 grams of protein if you're 70 kilograms um, within a couple of hours go and train if you want some carbs before great then you'll train yeah. a little bit harder and then again within that 6 hour window have 35 grams of protein again you do not need to take it within like straight away after you train 75 seconds after the last rep There's the, uh, yeah the anabolic window so to speak is not 30 minutes it's yeah. 4 to 6 hours okay. um, and as long as you're getting your protein across the whole day that's what the, the main priority is which as you said is like 1.6 to 2.2 grams grams per yeah. kilogram body mass so you don't need to get your protein in but yes protein source after training sometime around after training is great and that can be from a whole food source or it could yeah. be from whey if you're not hungry which is really no. which is yeah. useful absolutely and the, and the kind of the more elite an athlete you are the more important that that <clears throat> that is obviously i think for the average average 
guy that kind of would be a men's fitness reader it's kind of we would say make sure you do the exercise and then eat to your hunger levels yeah. if, you're, if you're not hungry don't feel like you've got to force anything down you it's about especially if you're training for fat loss as well it's about listening and, and re kind of retuning yourself to your body's hunger needs that's yeah. the really important step which takes a little bit of time you're going to have to really kind of pay close attention and, and eat mindfully that's where that can really help but you know you don't feel like you've got to be eating every three hours just because yeah. you know someone maybe on instagram does that it's about doing what you need to do for your health ultimately and I think that is an amazing place to finish. Uh, it's been so insightful. It's been amazing to listen to you guys talk. Um, really appreciate you coming down to the Dad Podcast and and pouring out your wisdom to the to the guys listening. I think you guys listening at home would have really enjoyed that as well. So um, I want to say a huge thank you to, to both Joe and Amelia. Thank you guys for listening to this episode of the Dad Podcast. If you've enjoyed it, please leave us a, a good rating, hopefully like a five star or something. I think these guys in here deserve a five star. And if you write a review, that would be amazing. I know that anybody that writes a review to this podcast will be in for a chance to win a tub of Optimum Nutrition um, protein. So if you leave a review, hopefully it's a good one. It doesn't have to be, but hopefully it's a good one. You enter yourself into a competition to win a tub of Optimum Nutrition protein. So thank you for listening. It's been amazing to have you guys in the studio and I hope you guys have enjoyed listening at home. And from this episode of The Dad Podcast, I will see you guys next time. Thank you very much.